Hello and welcome to this industry roundtable discussion on next steps in sustainability, achieving reliability in renewable energy. My name is Fauzia Marzuki and I'm with the Bloomberg NEF team. Today we've got six panelists who will be talking about renewable energy and how we can ensure reliability for the future energy transition. The first question I'd like to put forth to our panelists is, let, let's, let's uh, talk about it from an argument perspective. People say that natural gas was the transition fuel for coal. Uh, and natural gas is supposed to bridge us into a renewable energy uh, world and the energy transition. But there's st still coal today. So uh, maybe the first question I'd like to pose it to our panelists, uh, Danielle, what would you say to industry participants who are saying that what, um, what's, what's the role of gas in the future? Are we potentially moving on uh, uh, too quickly into renewable energy that we're almost bypassing gas's role as a transition fuel? What would you say in response to that? Thank you. And I'm Danielle Mer Merfeld with GE Renewable Energy. Um, you know, within GE, we have three sort of legs of the stool as we think about the energy transition. We have our renewables business, which includes grid. We have our um, business around gas power. So, I mean, those are the those are the three pieces: renewable, grid, and gas power. And today, um, we see that grid and gas both play really critical supporting roles in achieving reliability across our renewable energy infrastructure space. Parts of the world are increasing their renewable penetration faster than others. So we're going to see where gas plays a critical role, where grid needs to be maintained or even improved or changed in its operation, but it won't be universal everywhere. So I think there's still a really important role that all of these technologies play, and they will change over time, but it will be highly um, regional. Um Keith, you're you're taking care of a portfolio for renewable energy in uh, in the Asia Pacific. Would you have anything to add to that? Absolutely. Um, and and then speaking more globally, um, I think uh, the Daniela's points there are very valid. The, we're moving from a world that currently is just two thirds fossil fuels to one that's going to be two thirds renewables by the by. 2050. Um, so natural gas absolutely has a part to play in that. It will still be a part. But the big question is how we evolve the power generation system. The power generation system has always been a diverse portfolio of uh, sources of power generation. And that's evolving and getting more complex. And uh, Danielle touched on a few th things there, that the grid, how the grid interfaces. We now have a more distributed um, set of power generation, more local, uh, right down to the house and eventually, we will, hopefully, we'll talk about electric vehicles, which ultimately are, are batteries that are floating around the place. So there's a broad spectrum um, there of new technologies that are going to come into the power generation system. But natural gas has a part to play. Coal, I genuinely believe, does not have a part to play. The sooner we move away from it, goodbye, good riddance. Um, but gas has a part to play and it will still be there. But equally, wearing my renewable hat, the faster we can push gas out of out of it I, I would equally think that's that's important but I think for the next uh, my generation or the rest of my career gas will still be uh, still be part of it that's great um, so some people in the industry would say natural gas is a potential hurdle or an obstacle to implementing renewable energy and uh, the, uh, sort of like moving forward with this energy transition. The next question I'd uh, sort of more broadly, um, I'd like to put it to Sujay. Um, what would you, what, what's your take on today? What are the main hurdles with achieving this transition, go, moving forward with the transition to more renewable energy power generation? Thanks, Fazia. This is Sujay Shaw from Standard Chartered Bank. I lead the clean tech sector coverage here. So, uh, was you know, interesting question uh, in terms of what the key barriers are. Uh, I would uh, list a few. Uh, the first and the foremost, and I'm sure we're going to speak a lot around this, is around the reliability of re uh, renewable power and whether that can be provided 24-7. Uh, the second one is cost. Now, that is coming down quite rapidly almost everywhere, but we need to remember there are still markets uh, like Indonesia, uh, most of in fact Southeast Asia, where uh, fossil fuels are more cost competitive compared to uh, renewable power. And there, there's a question of energy access before the cleanness of energy. So we do need to uh, remember that the different regions with different sort of uh, requirements. 
And the third one, uh, and as a banker, one I wish must highlight uh, quite forcefully is around the financing challenge itself. Uh, now, the number for energy transition varies anywhere between a few trillion dollars to up to about 50 trillion over the next four to five decades. And uh, where is this money going to come from? Uh, the role that institutional investors actually need to play because from a bank perspective, there's only a limited amount that banks can finance. So where is exactly this money going to come from? And the third more important bit is that bulk of this money is going to be required in emerging markets. And who's actually going to provide this financing in markets which need it the most are the key questions which might sort of determine which way the energy transition goes and how the speed at which it goes. That's great. I want to send it maybe to that to Abigail. So um, you as a sort of a, a, a pro prominent um, industry uh, player in the in the solar industry, how would you convince Sujay that solar is the way to go? Solar is uh, um, what, what we want to do and how we're, we're going to make it through this energy transition. What would be your pitch in order to, uh, to, to the financial community about how you would overcome some of these hurdles that we just heard? Yeah, thank you. And um, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm Abby Hopper. I'm the CEO of the Solar Energy Industries Association, which is a trade association here in the United States that represents the solar and the solar plus storage industry. And so I would I would start there, uh, Sujay, and you know this, that the, the transition and the, the technological advances and the cost reductions, particularly in storage, and the pairing of these resources together really addresses uh, a lot of the reliability concerns. Um, I think that Dr. Q can talk about his technology and his company, and I'll let him do that. Uh, but I do think that that is by far the most impactful piece um, and the most exciting part of this transition. Um, I do think that, um, you know, this, to the earlier question about sort of the role of natural gas and the length of this transition, um, you know, I think we would all agree that there will be natural gas. I think the real question is how much more are we going to invest in it, right? Like there's what's the assets that exist now, but new assets and whether or not they become sunk costs or, or, or stranded costs for ratepayers is a really important um, issue. And, and we spent a lot of time sort of looking at solar plus storage versus natural gas, what their generation portfolio looks like, what their cost projections are, and why that's really a better outcome. Um, and, you know, I would just add sort of, uh, I don't. I can't solve your financing. That's your job, CJ. <laughs> um, but I do think that if we think about sort of access, one of the things I love about this technology is its scalability. And so, you know, we can build uh, huge power plants in the middle of deserts, and we can light up an operating room um, in a small country that maybe is experiencing energy poverty, and we can do everything in between. Um, I think it's fairly unique in that way. And so to sort of those emerging markets, I think they have applications um, where a centralized grid system just might not be applicable, but a distributed system that provides solutions for people um, is, is much more uh, transformative. So we, we talked about um, uh, growth in gas and, you know, we are in a Qatar economic forum. And, you know, the, uh, so, so the idea is that a lot of global gas producers and suppliers are touting the idea that natural gas is supposed to help with reliability and uh, renewable energy. But I would like to turn it now to maybe uh, first to Dr. Shanku. What aspects or what, what kind of framework, what what kind of roadmap do you see? Or what are the things we need to do in order to ensure uh, or work towards uh, ensuring there is reliability for renewable um, for renewable energy uh, production that perhaps doesn't involve natural gas or will it have to involve natural gas? Your your thoughts. Hi, folks. This is uh, this is Sean Chu from Canadian Solar. Now, first, let me uh, uh, address to uh, to uh, what uh, Daniel and Keith said. Uh, let's face it. It's impossible to uh, decarbonize fossil fuel because fossil fuel is carbon. And if you have a uh, gas facility, let's say a combined gas, combined cycle uh, gas facility already there, you may want to run it to the end of your life. But if you are going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in five years to build a new uh, gas power facility, well, frankly speaking, that will be your sunk cost because 
today, solar plus uh, lithium battery stor uh, storage uh, is already reliable and also cost competitive. Now, I want to tell you one story. Um, we have one uh, project in California. It's a uh, solar plus storage project. We call it Slate. Uh, it's a 300 megawatt solar plus uh, 550 megawatt hours of uh, of uh, storage. Now, uh, it was one of the largest in California back in uh, 2017, 2018. Uh, 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 2018. So uh, it was a challenge by that time. So we actually had a uh, uh, off-site, all-hand uh, strategy in Camel, California, back in uh, 2018. And we look at all different kind of lithium battery technologies. We also look into uh, flow batteries. Then we design our own uh, uh, battery pack, the BMS, the PCS. And then by the time when we lock down the design uh, at the end of 2020, now the cost of solar is already below two cents per kilowatt hours. And the cost of four hour battery storage is around four cents. So altogether around six cents, that's solar plus four hours of, of, uh, of energy storage. Now, if you want to build a new uh, gas facility in California, I guess uh, your LCOE will be also be the range of uh, five to seven cents. So uh, that's my point, you know, rather than uh, uh, building a new uh, gas facility, you would rather use that money and uh, also time to build a uh, solar plus uh, energy storage facility. Now, come to the technology. Uh, what are the uh, breakthrough technology we require uh, to uh, make uh, the, uh, to optimize the uh, solar plus storage asset? And I, uh, well, actually, the solar, both solar and wind uh, technology are already very mature. You can already deploy it in large scale. So if I'm going to uh, point to one breakthrough technology, I would say that will be the, uh, the uh, artificial intelligence and big data enabled uh, energy planning and trading system. Because in order to optimize your storage facility, you have to make minute by minute trading decision. And only that kind of system can work. That's um, that's fascinating, and I'd love to talk about the game-changing technologies uh, in, in in just a moment. But we've we've heard a lot about solar. I'd actually like to turn it to Ina now to talk about the uh, well, sort of balance between solar and the other clean uh, clean energy technologies. Maybe, Ina, if you'd like to share sort of on what are your thoughts on what are the frameworks and uh, sort of potential building blocks in order to ensure uh, reliability for renewable energy. Yes, so I'll address, the, address some of the subjects. First of all, I think regarding the gas, I think gas position right now in the world is pretty safe. 80% uh, of the global energy is being still produced by different fossil fuels, if it's oil or coal or gas. Uh, so I don't think there's any risk for it to disappear anytime in the near future. Um, according to the United Nations, also 60% of the global greenhouse gas emissions are directly caused by the way that we're harnessing our energy. So that's kind of the negative side, of course, of uh, fossil fuels. So, of course, all of us are kind of, uh, I think the whole world right now is in the same side and we would all like to see a 100% environmentally friendly world. So what's actually stopping it? I think the lack of variety. Uh, because uh, solar energy, wind energy, uh, they kind of started their commercialization early on. And many countries kind of got locked on those technologies, which is amazing. They're great technologies, like I'm speaking from Israel. We have a great resource of sun. But at the moment that the government put some solar farms here and saw that it's working, they said, OK, so we have the sun. We don't need wind. We don't need wave. We don't need uh, any type of other energy. And that's kind of a, a problem because then they started building these huge farms, you know, and the night comes and then 
hundreds of megawatts shut off and it's not so good for the grid. And then, of course, you can't get the stability. So the best way, again, although I'm from EcoWave Power, a wave energy company, so I'm not exactly uh, objective. I'm a strong believer in wave energy. I do think that the solution for kind of having a 100% renewable energy friendly world is combining all renewable energy sources together. So during the day when it's very sunny and not so wavy or not so windy, then the solar energy will be the main source. During the night, it can be wind or wave. And also depending on the country, depend on, depending on the natural resources. So I think that kind of, um, you know, policymakers need to get out of uh, kind of the technology that we already know that are working, that are cost efficient. You know, it took them 20 to 30 years to get to that point and start also opening up to new technologies, which are especially complementary to the type of technologies that are already working in their countries. And then really we have a much better chance of having the 100% you know, renewable energy friendly world. That's great. I love I love the idea of sort of like diversity and inclusive, making sure that there's a mix in order to sort of hedge all your bets as well. I'd like to turn maybe on that note, I'd like to turn the next question to um, to Keith. In your uh, sort of from an investment perspective, is there are you going for a mix in order to ensure reliability uh, or is there a particular technology or particular aspect that you're focusing on with regards to um, to your investments and how you see the industry? Yeah. So as a infrastructure investor, um, uh, you're looking for long term um, uh sustainable uh, offtake. So there, to Dr. Chu's uh, comments there in terms of in the solar, when you look at the solar and you look at the cost competitiveness in certain markets, because I think Sujay took, touched on a, on a very interesting point there. You, California is not comparable with, with Indonesia, you know, or with other locations for a variety of, of reasons. Um, the access and then the, the structure. You also have, say, for example, Japan, um, which is much more expensive than, than say, other parts of the world to produce uh, to produce electricity. So um, as an infrastructure investor, you're looking at um, uh, somewhat established uh, technologies. I, I equally take Dr. Chu's uh, comment there that solar and wind are now are now well established. Um, and you're looking for long-term 30 year plus um, assets um, that are well managed, and that you have um, you have your 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 offtake from that. Whether that is merchant, what we call just the the, the power price, or whether that's uh, government backed or, or locked in by some way, but that's that's what you're looking at. Um, looking at something like wave a uh, wave power or other technologies, um, that's a, a different um, uh, investor base that would at this stage still would still be more venture capital. I would uh, su uh, would suggest. Uh, Danielle, would you uh, have anything else to add to this line of uh, discussion? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just to add to the idea about variability and flexibility, sort of these different resources, another way to think about it, in addition to variety of renewable technologies that complement each other, which is certainly a key tenant of the renewable future, there's also variability geographically. And in addition to sort of one of the things that might hold us back is permitting and regulation of more renewable assets. There's also the permitting and the scale of growth of our transmission and distribution infrastructure. Because if we can link more of our renewable assets ac broadly across regions through a grid interplay, then we've got more resilience, we've got more uh, capability to manage variability and balance. Um, things like storage and solar are really great for helping close some of that gap. Um, but there's still going to be frequency response mechanisms. We're going to need sort of this integrated capability. And then, of course, grid technologies to solve um, some of those stability issues that might happen just because of our power electronics that we're plugging into the grid in a new way. You know, the grid is designed to operate based on synchronous generators. And as we replace those with more variable renewable energy, we just have to operate the grid differently. So there's this transition where we we want the we want the economics to win. We want the stability and resilience, and um, we want favorable outcomes for everyone. And I think we have to think holistically, even to the market models. How are we rewarding capacity and flexibility? So this is one of the one of the most exciting systems problems that the world is facing, and it's a challenge I think for everyone in all sectors and functions um, across business and government. Definitely one of those um, challenges. Uh, it, um, Ina, would you like to add to that, perhaps? 
Uh, yes, I just would like to refer to what uh, Keith said. Uh, I think that kind of what he said exactly kind of reason resonances with what I said before is that really uh, the main problem of the world is that kind of uh, ancient, no offense, way of thinking, that kind of what's, what works for a very, very long period of time is the only thing that we should use, and that's what not, is not enabling the variety. But there are many large-scale companies which in the past had the same vision, like big electrical companies, which are now uh, investors in EcoWave Power, for example, EDF, the French National Electrical Company, is now investing with us in a power station in Israel, Meridian, the largest uh, electric company in Australia and New Zealand, it signed with us a collaboration agreement. So I really think the world and different funds, different uh, governmental organizations need to move from this kind of blocked way of thinking, because this is in the end uh, what will enable us to have the diversity that we aspire again for a uh, to have the transition to a 100% renewable energy friendly world. So, Keith, I would uh, rethink the answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Keith, do you want to respond to that? Or? Oh, well, no, I, 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 look, I don't, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I think what I said, excuse me, was that it would be, as a, me as an investor, I think the question was asked to me in terms of as an infrastructure investor, um, as a, a venture capital investor, so absolutely. So, a large organization, you mentioned a few companies there, would have a section, and I'm sure Danielle, in, in GE, there would be a portion of the capital pool that you would put into emerging uh, technologies, emerging opportunities, and whether that's on the grid, whether that's investing in AI, I think that's a fascinating point that uh, Dr. Chu has brought up, as well as Daniela there, in terms of the grid integration um, we have here in Europe, um, we have, you know, in, in, in Ireland, is as an island where I'm, I'm based, um, we're pushing 40% renewables and heading towards 60%. Um, so the grid and how we interface that with the United Kingdom and Europe is going to play a huge part of it. But no, I take your point and excuse me um, uh, uh, in terms of your reaction to it. But um, I, I, I do believe that there are those technologies. Solar was once that, if you go back to 20, 2006 or when Dr. Chu started solar, Canadian solar in 2001, um, solar was 20 times the cost of what it is now, where you know there's been a 95% cost reduction. So it, it may well come in other, in other technologies. I'll hand the mic back. <laughs> so, Sujay, you know, we, we talked about sort of old mindset and needing to transition and sort of the resources that might potentially be required in order to enable this. Um, do, uh, would you like to add anything to the, uh, what we've been discussing? <laughs> yeah, it was a fascinating discussion. And uh, I think uh, the exchange between um, uh, Ina and Keith uh, is also something that sort of plays internally within Standard Chartered as well, right? So there is always newer technologies coming up. And if you think about energy transition in a broader scale, right? So one is obviously we're talking about things like solar and wind, which um, uh, Dr. Chu said is more established now, but there are equally new technologies like green hydrogen, batteries, uh, CCUS, that are increasingly coming up. And the only thing I can add is that the pace at which these transitions are now happening is quite unprecedented compared to what used to happen earlier. So earlier it used to take a couple of decades for these technologies to become mainstream, whereas now that transition is becoming faster and faster. And uh, it's incumbent, uh, I guess, on all of us to make sure that within our organizations, we are responding adequately. So for instance, uh, at Standard Charter, we have set up sort of distinct working groups to tackle each of these uh, subsectors as they come up. And we are now looking at financing. For instance, we financed uh, some of the battery plants that have come up uh, on the EV side. Um, you know, we've also advised one of our clients on green hydrogen in terms of um, uh, what projects they could in, uh, invest in. So that pace of transition and uh, the rate at which our internal organizations respond to change is extremely important for uh, the overall energy transition progress. Yeah, talking about uh, so so talk, you know you talked about sort of a, a team that you've set up for 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 doing all of this. Uh, I'd like to um, pose the next question to Abigail. So you know we talked about um, the enablers for the transition. Of course, the technology needs to be developed. Uh, you know needs to advance in order to move us along this transition. But in order to execute it in the time frame that we want to carry out this energy transition, what else do we need to make it work, Abigail? Yeah, no, it's a it's an important question. And I think 
sort of goes to the point that Sujay raised early on, like what will the pace of this transition be, right? And it's impacted by lots of things. We haven't talked a lot about policy yet. That's where I spend most of my time is on the policy front. And obviously there's a, a variety of, you know, national policy, local policy that impacts this. I could uh, go on about that, but I won't. I think one of the things that sometimes gets forgotten is the human element of this transition, um, both in terms of the customers that we serve and whom we choose to employ. And I think if this is going to be a successful transition that really has the support of the communities um, that are impacted by these energy transitions, we have to be really intentional. Um, so I think about sort of Citing um, solar projects or citing wind projects, citing wave projects, doesn't matter, right? But citing and building community support and really um, earning that social license to operate is a really important piece of it. And so I think we have an opportunity in this transition to do it better than perhaps it's been done in the past, right? Instead of like plopping down <laughs> facilities and communities that perhaps um, were not uh, always had a voice, we can really engage in a very different way. So I think that's one of the that will be one of the markers of success is if we can do that um, in a meaningful way. I think also, you know, we just talked in the United States about meeting the president, our current president's uh, climate goals, and we will uh, quadruple the size of the of the of the solar workforce, right? And then think about that times the entire world. Um, but in my, my uh, many people's goal, and mine in particular, is to make sure that that workforce looks reflects the diversity of our country, right? The United States is an incredibly diverse country um, and our workforce is not at that point yet. And again, it requires intentionality. It requires a commitment to doing that. It requires outreach to communities and people that perhaps we haven't always see, thought to recruit from. Uh, but it also requires sort of a, a different thought process, right? We're not, I'm not, we're not looking to just provide a job, right? We're looking to provide careers and we're looking to provide entrepreneurial opportunities. And so as you guys are talking about sort of these new and emerging technologies, that's an incredible opportunity to create wealth and create business ownership, perhaps in communities that haven't always had that opportunity. So uh, that's one of the parts that, you know, I find so many things exciting about this transition. <laughs> when Daniel I was talking about the grid interface, I was like, yes, yes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. But this piece as well, right? Like the human element, energy is one of those things that impacts every single human on this planet. Um, and so making sure that, that uh, we, we are inclusive and deliberate in how we employ folks and how we distribute this energy, I think, is an important part of this transition. So in order to make renewable energy reliable, we need reliable people. <laughs> right. um, does anybody else uh, maybe want to chime in on the resource? Uh, what are the necessary resources and enablers? Uh, maybe if we want to uh, elaborate a bit more on the human capital element, uh, people. I, I, think, I think the human part is, is, is so important. And I think, um, Abigail, thank you so much for, for bringing it up. Um, as you said, the communities that we work, that we, that we're going to build um, all these um, uh, power stations in. Um, there, the impact on them, whether that's the wave technology, whether that's offshore, offshore wind with the fishermen, uh, whether that's in a community on the side of a hill. So somebody visually was looking up at a hill for many years, and now there's wind turbines. So to one person's eyes, that's there are things of beauty, and other person's eyes, they're 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 literally eyesores. So bringing the world with us uh, and and the communities that we that were we exist in will be extremely important. Uh, we talk and we throw around numbers of, of four times uh, the increase in the United States of solar or X increase in, in EV charge, uh, EV, EV cars, which is probably less impactful, but in other, other um, uh, power generation sources. Um, but that, they, they do need to get the permitting. They do need to get through the local communities. And we all have so much experience of objections, of court cases, of delays, etc. So that's something that we can't lose sight of and we need we need people constantly working on. Um, also, oh yeah, please, also, Dr. Dr. Uh, Shaw. Yeah. I also want to echo on the, uh, on the comment on the, uh, on the human factor and which is indeed very important. Now, Canadian Solar uh, has built and operated factories in seven different uh, countries and regions and uh, now, in my 25 years of experience, I always feel like 
it is important not only to bring solar and renewable to, to the community, but also make sure that the community get economic value and also develop their own you know, human capital uh, with this with re renewable. Now, uh, Abby, you mentioned United States. I also want to uh, like mention Africa because don't forget that uh, uh, somewhere around 1.2 billion uh, people uh, in the world still uh, has no electricity, and I believe 600 or 700 million of them living in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, now solar is a perfect uh, choice, perfect tool to provide not only the access to the electricity, but also I call it the energy equality to those peoples. And uh, now, uh, uh, you know, back in 2014, you know, I, I went to Paris for the COP21. And uh, then I made a call. I said, well, you know, why don't we light up uh, the Africa using uh, solar? And uh, now one of the topic is infrastructure, right? And solar is actually require a little, very little uh, infrastructure. And also, you know, for the countries with a weak uh, grid, and uh, you know, solar it will be the best way. Also, solar can create lots of local jobs. And I'll just add, I, I agree with everything my fellow panelists have said here about the human um, perspective, whether it's in the factories, how we make things, what kind of new jobs emerge, and even you know the fact that we have consumers and producers that are more you know company or even individual household level. The one thing I would add is. Um, you know, there's also an opportunity for households or individuals to play a role on the load side because that stability and maintain maintenance of resilience at the grid level, we always think of it as a generation side issue and transmission and distribution manages the generation um, and manages um, at the high level how, how we in, uh, interfere with the way the normal operation is to keep things stable. There's an untapped opportunity to engage consumers at all levels in their load management without even disturbing, without even them noticing, but it's gotta be done in collaboration. And I think that's one way to enable renewable energy to be not just highly penetrated, but reliably highly penetrated is to start pulling on both of those sides of the, you know, both of those levers um, for value. I'm gonna let uh, Ina and Sujay chime in here. Maybe Ina, you first. <laughs> Thank you. So basically, uh, from personal experience, I would like to say that I think that the thing that is tough in, let's say, wave power, my company the most, is really lack of regulations and lack of policies, similar to what Abigail said, because let's say the Gibraltar, we have a working power station grid connected in Gibraltar since 2016. The construction of the power station was six months, but trying to get the regulation in order to be able to construct was like two years. And that's with a government that was amazing and was extremely committed and supportive. So think like that you have to penetrate each and every market that completely has no regulation for new energy sources. And it happened to us day by day. We install our floaters on breakwaters, on piers, on jetties, these kind of structures. They mostly are owned by uh, coastal cities or ports. And we have like 100 emails a day of ports and coastal cities contacting us and saying we want this in our city and then we say okay great we're coming we're gonna put it there what do we have to do and then the answer is we don't know there's no policy let us set the policy and come back to us you know so the technology readiness is there and really the excitement from the client and the desire from cities to have energy diversity is there, but like the connecting point, which is the regulation is not there yet for innovative technology. And I think that's a big problem when the technology kind of bypasses the regulation, you know, the kind of the regulation goes after the technology and that really stops progress. So uh, I think what we're going to do in the last 10 minutes or so of the session, let's do a bit of a round robin because we, we uh, sort of my, my, my panelists has reminded me I haven't talked about policy just yet. <laughs> so let's uh, let's spend the last 10. Let's, let's spend the last 10 minutes to talk about um, for each of you to um, hopefully share with us maybe your one key policy aspect or key enabler that governments and institutions need to establish in order to 
uh, you know, uh, ensure that we have an ecosystem that allows renewable energy to thrive. One, it actually enables the uh, sort of large scale production of it and also uh, addressing reliability at, at the same stage. So uh, I did want Sujay to start. So so we're going to go. So we're going to go gentlemen first. <laughs> we'll start with Sujay and then we'll go to Dr. Sean, Keith, and, and then we'll go on to the, uh, to the ladies on the panel to close up. OK, so everybody round robin of, of the one key policy related aspect that you think will uh, ensure this transition? Sure. So I think, uh, look, uh, what sort of uh, emerged quite conclusively from this conversation is that everyone agrees that the opportunity is quite large. And uh, this is going to require lots and lots of um, uh, investors to put in money. And the number one thing that any investor will look for is stability and predictability of policy. So I think uh, it, quite a few times we've had uh, change of governments and uh, change of regulations which come post that, uh, lots of investor uncertainty. So I think the best thing that the governments can do is provide very clear, long-term predictable guidance to the market in terms of where they see the growth coming and then provide um, uh, auctions or other mechanisms for them to get those projects in place. And number two, I would say, would be around the uh, permitting and the licenses, uh, which again is quite key for especially emerging markets. Okay, now over to uh, Dr. Sean. Well, actually, uh, my comment is almost uh, the same as Suji. Uh, policy is important, uh, for especially for solar. And and also uh, for storage, for example, United, in United States, uh, there's still we still need uh, policy change in quite a few states in order to allow uh, battery uh, storage uh, to be uh, installed uh, on the uh, you know uh, connected to the to the uh, to the utility. And also, uh, you know, in the United States, we also always talk about ITC and. And uh, ITC is also important. And uh, also, I think some kind of uh, further uh, like tax regulations. Uh, if somehow we can uh, allow uh, solar and storage asset to qualify, you know, for REITs, uh, that would be very, uh, very good. Uh, Canadian Solar has one uh, fund, we call it Canadian Solar Infrastructure Fund, traded on Tokyo Stock Ex Exchange because at this moment, uh, uh, Japan is the only place where uh, solar asset uh, can qualify for REITs. And I hope uh, we will see that uh, in the uh, United States. Now we're up to Keith. Oh, it's such a broad topic. And um, you, you, we spoke there of, of something very specific, and we, Dr. Chu uh, of the United States, but it, it's a global um, issue. And I think from a top down and bottom up, so from the top down, I think the best thing that governments can do is to pass the zero, um, uh, the, the net zero targets by 2050. There's a global momentum to that. I think there's 65 countries that have made that binding. That needs to continue because that is sets the overarching framework. And then from the bottom up, taking uh, Inez points there in terms of new technologies, but across the globe, there are different issues and challenges, whether it's how permits or the legal system in a particular country works, um, how you can get access to that harbour, how you can get access to that field to put your wind farm in. And there, there needs to be in each country then the coordination to make that happen. But I think if it comes from the top down that we are going on this direction, then that will force governments and people's hands that they will need to make a number of these changes to permitting laws, to uh, large uh, grid interconnections, to in, in, in Africa, as we spoke about there um, earlier on, which is much more distributed, much more local, how all of these things happen. But uh, I think the, uh, the leadership from the large economies of the world, the large governments of the world that forcing net zero, and then the others will trickle down other from that is what's, uh, what's important. All right, now I'm gonna to go to Danielle and then Ina and then Abigail. So, Great. thank you. Um, and I, I will say much of what I was thinking is very similar to what we've heard. So I'll just augment by saying, um, rather than say a specific policy, I'll talk about outcomes. Being able to have assurance of, um, of opportunity and what the market will look like is key. Certainly having permitting, licensing, there's too many barriers, even in a more mature renewable energy space such as wind, which I would argue 
still has a tremendous track, you know, runway of change ahead of it. Um, being able to deploy some of those new technologies and prove out how they can contribute to the health of the grid is, is really only at the pace it was last year. Having the increasing pace will be difficult to meet without more build out, faster permitting, and of course, transmission and distribution infrastructure that supports it globally. Ina? Yes, so I will uh, formulate, first of all, I agree with everybody, everything that was said is very uh, important, but uh, I will uh, formalize my answer in uh, a way of wishing, so I have two uh, wishes from the policy makers, one, just make policies, you know, stop, <laughs> because in our case they just don't exist in many of the countries, and really number two is uh, similar to what Suja have said, is if you're making policies, make them stable. Because in many European countries like the UK and Portugal, they have set amazing policies for wave energy. And when technologies actually came and tried to kind of take advantage of that pol these policies, the government said, oh, but nobody applied when we set them. So we canceled the policies. Now we have nothing again. So please make them stable for like enough time for us to actually kind of use these policies. It, this was, would be really helpful for us. Uh, over to you, Abigail, and I will challenge you to mention something that ho hasn't already been mentioned yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I will do that because I'm going to think of it while I'm talking. Um, but in the meantime, I would certainly echo, I mean, the this certainty, you know, we, we talked about this huge opportunity that we have, trillions of dollars of investment, you know, to today's point, where is that investment going to come from? Well, it's going to come from many of the people in this room and their funds and their investments, and you need certainty. Before I did this, I was a, a attorney for private, you know, private equity, and so I get it, right? Like, you need certainty. That is the mo most important part. Um, I think never underestimating the role that government can play in, in sending clear market signals, right? And so the sort of if it's a 0% carbon by a date certain, if it is here are the rules of the marketplace, and we're going to uh, re reward or pay for uh, capacity, right? Just the government says this is what we care about, and then the private industry um, can can pivot and collaborate and compete and make it happen. I think the other uh, piece of policy that I would say that hasn't been talked about really follows up on our our workforce discussion. Um, I started the conversation by talking about natural gas. Uh, we talked about the technology. We did not talk about all the people that work in natural gas, right? And as we think about this transition, it's certainly a transition of technology, but it's also a transition of people, right? People who far may have formerly worked in fossil fuels who are faced with this um, perhaps opportunity or perhaps uh, fear of working in a new industry. And so being, again, having the government spend some time and energy in uh, re reskilling some of those people, making sure that opportunity is available to them and training is available to them um, so that there can be a transition that really builds up communities and doesn't feel like a threat to someone's way of life would be a, a huge um, opportunity to have. Awesome. And uh, as somebody who's been in the oil and gas industry for a very long time, I'm actually very excited to be working on this transition uh, with, with all of you today. And I'd love to be able to transition, uh, undergo that transition with, with everybody here today. So uh, just as a recap, so for everybody listening in, the key elements that we talked about in terms of policy. So for all the uh, policymakers and institutional uh, bodies out there listening today, what we, um, the, 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 the main things that the panelists talked about were Really, I'd summarize it as certainty for reliability. Make the policy, then make the policy stable, uh, potential uh, financial initiative, uh, uh, initiatives, so tax breaks of some kind, permitting, investments in transmission and distribution in order to build that out, top-down uh, top down direction, set the net zero targets, and most importantly, help to transition your workforce to make it all, uh, to make it all happen. Well, uh, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, this panel this, this panel discussion. Abigail, Danielle, Ina, Keith, Dr. Sean, and Sujay, thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of the day. And um, to everybody listening, enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you very much.